March 4th was a pretty awesome day for two reasons. Number one, I released my new patch for my Fire Emblem ROM hack, which is pretty sick, go try it out. And two, Triangle Strategy was released, a game that I had been anticipating playing ever since it was announced. Back then, the first demo, occurring just while Roland was attempting to stop S. Frost's siege on Glenbrook Castle, was our first peek into the gameplay and writing. From familiar feeling gameplay of Tactics Ogre and Political Intrigue, also from those kind of games, this game was sure to evoke excitement from the SRPG crowd. I quite enjoyed the demo. It was a little slow and clunky, and the voice acting didn't leave a strong impression, but it was wise to thrust you right into the conflict, as the actual beginnings of this game are, as I will discuss in this spoiler-free review, are quite slow to get things rolling. For those watching this and have already played through the game in full, or are currently playing, here are my credentials as of 1 in the morning on March 13th. I am over 70 hours into this game, doing a New Game++ plus plus hard playthrough, and I'm in the midst of completing my endings. So while I haven't cleared a hard mode playthrough yet, I get the idea. And because it is spoiler free, this video and review will be rather brief. I'll start with the gameplay, then the conviction system the story is built off of, and then a brief bit on what to actually expect from the writing. This game honestly, is an incredibly deep strategy game that very carefully opens its depth up to you as you progress along the game, recruiting new units who trend upwards in complexity. You begin with your standard offensive combat unit, offensive mage, healer, all-around warrior, and a support unit. In time, new characters with stuff like attributes that can set obstacles and traps on the field are recruited. One unit can inflict a multitude of status and range. The difficulty scales up very, very naturally, with difficulty spikes fitting the narrative, so it doesn't even feel cheap when they happen. As the game progresses, you realize that the new aptitudes, or skills, learned through leveling up and promoting and weapon abilities learned through forging, allow you to reevaluate a unit's worth and test potential new strategies in grinding missions so as to perform them efficiently on an actual story map. While some units feel awful to use and are genuinely bad at first, the more you invest into them, the more aptitudes and weapon forging abilities learned, they can very quickly 180 into incredibly fun and useful units. Most units are capable of being good, but like any strategy game, some units are plain not that good whatsoever, especially on hard mode. But that's for you to decide. The chapter goal variety isn't that high, usually it's just defeating all enemies or defeating boss or reaching a point on a map, so if anything, bear that in mind. Another very, very satisfying aspect of the gameplay is that while yes, it's not linear in that you can grind maps for EXP and gold, it is virtually impossible to overlevel. Grinding is ridiculously easy, making it so your units that are being underused can very quickly catch up. Anything, and I mean anything, grants EXP. Healing a full HP unit, breaking blocks, barricades, dealing zero damage, anything that can have your character interact with anything will grant EXP. For example, say Roland has been on my bench for the past 5 maps and he's 10 levels behind Serenoa. I can simply enter a mental mock battle at a recommended level well beyond Roland's level, get Roland to do like 12 things on a map, and he'll be caught up very close to his friend. That said, EXP rates drastically shorten to 1 to 4 EXP per action if you are above the recommended level. Attempts to overlevel are virtually impossible, but grinding is also made ridiculously easy. It's a fantastic combination, and I really, really enjoyed it. Now, while this may sound like the game is forcing you to keep up with its difficulty, and possibly making it feel like leveling up could feel meaningless since enemies always scale with you, your EXP and levels actually go more towards things like aptitudes and weapon abilities. It's not about raw stats so much as it's about the development and understanding of your roster's abilities as they learn them to use against their foes. Quietuses are also a fun map mechanic which deserve a mention here too. They're free actions that grant very strong abilities like a guaranteed critical hit, granting another ally to move directly after the current ally, movement stat boosts, literal mid-party swapping, and so on. Even learning how to integrate these and comboing them with the aptitudes for stronger moves is awesome. And with a hefty cast of characters of whom more will be locked on multiple playthroughs, tinkering around with different combinations of characters and skills to learn what is most synergistic with your own playstyle makes you feel genuinely smart and you are rewarded when these strategies work. A strategy game should always make you feel great when you come up with a plan and execute it well, and should usually punish you for making silly mistakes of which you are tasked to learn from and understand why they happened and what you can do next time to succeed. This game does that in spades, which makes this so much fun for dozens and dozens of hours upon hours. 
If you are looking for a deep and challenging strategy game, at least try the demo. For me, I played my first run on normal and I found it to be an engaging and enjoyable experience without being overly sweaty and stressful. I would advise, even as a veteran strategy game player, to try normal and then try hard on New Game Plus. The differences between difficulties are literally just damage multipliers and nothing else. And while that seems lazy and lame, it does demand more thoughtful and advanced tactics, no pun intended, to win, which is a reward in itself. There is a caveat to this which I will mention here. I will say that the decision to simply change damage multipliers does actually end up screwing non-utility damage dealing focused characters more than anyone else, especially if they're melee specific damage dealers. It's one of the least enjoyable aspects of hard mode, and it makes me feel like I can't use as much of the cast that I want, especially one of my more favorite characters. While yes, you need to make better use of your items and support slash utility characters, a noticeable amount of characters just end up feeling unfun to use. Another aspect of the gameplay that I've come to start exploiting is the enemy AI. Sometimes they break entirely. Certain kinds of environmental map interactions will force the AI to behave in clearly unintended ways, while yes, making some maps much easier and ends up sometimes trivializing the challenge of some of these maps. You can often force enemy units to run around in circles until you get into their range because there is no way for them to maneuver around fire or something. Difficulties can be changed on the fly, and unlike Fire Emblem, you can switch difficulty in either direction. This is actually awesome, because you can switch to very easy on a second playthrough if you just want to breeze through the gameplay while experiencing new stories and paths. And if you want to play through the final climactic ending, you can just switch the difficulty up to normal or hard to make it feel like a memorable fight. That's about all I can say about the gameplay, but I would like to talk about the UI for a moment and the performance on the Switch. Personally, I do wish the game would run faster. I have an old Switch model, so I don't know if that contributes to it, but I have often experienced instances of lag and frame drops. Some map environments slow down very noticeably, which is annoying. It's not the smoothest ride. You can tinker around with visual quality settings, but it kind of sucks to still happen anyway. My least favorite aspect of the gameplay is threat ranges and how frustrating it can feel sometimes to maneuver the camera to get somewhat of a feel for enemy ranges. You know how in Fire Emblem you can just toggle on enemy ranges or toggle the entire enemy's map range? This game does not have that and instead has eye-searingly bright squares which indicate different kinds of ranges. And with a game which height and threat range are so important to factor in, especially on harder difficulties, I do wish more thought was put into allowing the player to infer information more clearly from the enemy. I think someone with colorblindness would find this overlapping bright blue, red, purple, and green to be annoying. Switching through unit menus feels needlessly slow. In a game with so much preparation screen managing, as in picking units, equipping and switching accessories between units, and constantly returning to the encampment to purchase supplies, it all feels needlessly clunky. There's like a second and a half lag after doing anything, and it feels like a stylistic choice with like crossfades and stuff. Maneuvering through unit select and accessories just kind of sucks. Couldn't they just have the encampment shops and forge just be available in the prep screen itself? I know I'm evoking like Fire Emblem again right now and comparing it to that, but like the prep screen in Fire Emblem for all its UI goofiness at least had like Anna's shop and armories and things like that right there for you to use instead of jumping back to the monastery or something. I've been playing this game for like 70 hours and it still feels like equipping accessories is needlessly annoying for such a simple task. The excuse of you get used to it is not a legit defense here either. It's still annoying but that's just my opinion, man. Maybe you'll feel differently about it when you play. Clearly, it's not too detrimental where I dropped the game. Let's move on to some story stuff. The Conviction System. Liberty, morality, and utility are the name of the game for the Conviction System. Every so often, you'll be faced with a branching path based on your ability to sway your trusted wolf work pals. If you had any inkling that you could just make one set of choices in one run, then the opposite set of choices on the second run, you're wrong. This game has branches within branches. I will not disclose how many possibilities there are, but there are deceptively a lot of choices and paths to take. And if you're familiar with this team's track record of stuff like this, you should expect what usually comes from multiple path games, with multiple endings and so on. Personally, I found going back and making different choices intriguing and making more informed decisions felt rewarding. I have to insist one thing though. You don't need to worry about making the wrong choice. Due to New Game Plus, do not seek answers online for what does what or what happens when you do this on a blind playthrough. Just make the choices that you feel are right. Of this, I insist on. 
embrace the socio-political shitstorm that is Norzelia and try to make decisions that you deem are right and run with your own convictions, to use the game's words, not that of GameFAQs or some fuck-off Discord server. The story. As for the story itself, politics and utilitarianism rule Norzelia and everyone is out to take advantage of every situation they find themselves in. I've never played a game where ye old politics plays such a huge role, but many characters have really incredible personal motivations and plans to succeed, so it's intriguing to see all of these moving parts in a story. With that positive does come with a negative exposition and cutscenes. This game is loaded with fully voiced cutscenes, of which there are many vocal performances I am not super sold on, to say the least. The early game spends a lot of time trying to establish characters and motivations and puts its actual gameplay on the side for longer than I would have liked. I only ever played the first demo and to that one's credit, throwing you right into the conflict was a wise choice. I can't help but wonder what kind of impression the game would have had left on me if I played the most recent demo containing the first three chapters because that is very, very dialogue heavy for my tastes. Even though I would say the world building and lore is very, very cool, and what happens in the story itself is hella engaging, especially when I'm the one controlling the next move, it took me quite a long time to actually start feeling emotionally invested in the main character, Sarah Noah. He is his own character and is meant to be a measured young man who complements the personality of his friends, but he also feels like a bland avatar character as he must be malleable enough for all the presented choices to make sense for him given the circumstances, even if I personally think it fails on this front on certain paths. I wish I could say more and in more spoilery talks I will go into more detail about him and the other paths, but yeah. The story is otherwise very very enjoyable. The story script itself and the sheer amount of care the writers put into their world and key characters is truly fucking based. You will probably get sucked into the politics of this world and just keep playing to figure out what comes next and what's after that and after that and so on until you realize you have a problem. Let me just say, I'm not closing in on 80 hours in this game to replay the gameplay. The story itself took a while to hook me in, but once I bit, I still cannot let go until I have seen and read everything. All the lore, documents, notes, and so on. As for the price, I don't know about other currencies, but I spent around 90 Canadian on this game, and to me that was a ridiculously expensive purchase. I was seriously not expecting to pay that much for a game. Maybe it's the collapsing Canadian economy or something? I don't know. The good news is that this is a game that has longevity on its side. Even if you try rushing through the game, it will take quite a while to finish on a first playthrough. I believe it took me about 35 to 40 hours on my first normal run. The strength of games like these are its replay value, though. $90 is steep for me personally, but I'm still engaged with the game even 70 hours in. So I would just recommend trying the demo out. There is a good amount of gameplay and choices to sink your teeth in there. Anyways guys, this was my spoiler-free review of Triangle Strategy. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below if you've played the game or if you found this review helpful. I don't usually do spoiler-free reviews at all, if not ever, so I would like to know what you guys think. Um, this is my first scripted video on Triangle Strategy. Clearly, I very much enjoy and, let's be honest, love this game a lot. So if you guys are interested in more content covering this game, let me know what kind of things you would like to know. I've unlocked virtually every character. I'm very close to 100%ing the story. I've read the character interactions and stuff like that. So if you have any questions or if you have a, if you want someone to cover content on this game, let me know what you guys would like to see from me and the channel about Triangle Strategy. Anyways, folks, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like and comment down below. If you are new to the channel or if this is the first Triangle Strategy video you've seen or if if you're browsing about triangle strategy videos and you've seen this one and you've watched it, subscribe. That all being said, guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Deuces.